Welcome to the 83rd session of the American Legion Boy State of Kansas. My name is Brad Biles, and I serve as the Media Relations and Public Relations Director for the Kansas Boy State Program. I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker today. Kendall Gammon is a 15-year veteran of the National Football League, playing from 1992 to 2006 with the Pittsburgh Steelers, New Orleans Saints, and Kansas City Chiefs. Kendall attended Rose Hill High School and played collegiately at Pittsburgh State University where he was an offensive lineman and developed the skills uh, to eventually become what many, many consider to be the best long snapper in the NFL. While at Pitt State, Kendall was a member of the NCAA Division II National Championship Team in 1991 and runner-up team in 1992. Just prior to graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in education, Kendall was drafted by the Steelers, where he spent four seasons and played in Super Bowl 30. After another four years with the Saints, he signed with the Chiefs as a free agent, spending his final seven seasons in Kansas City, where he became the first pure long snapper to be selected to play in the Pro Bowl following the 2004-2005 season. Following his NFL career, Kendall continued his connection with the Chiefs, serving as an analyst for the Chiefs radio network for 12 years. Kendall, who currently serves as the Director of Development for Intercollegiate Athletics at Pitt State, has authored two books, Life's a Snap, Building on the Past to Improve Your Future, and Game Plan, Leadership Lessons from the Best of the NFL. Kendall has two sons, Blaze, who was a tight end here at K-State, and Drake, who is a member of the Strength and Conditioning staff at KU. Drawing on personal life challenges, Kendall will be delivering a message threaded with vulnerability and authentic stories to inspire you to use emotional strength to embrace change, build strong relationships, and positively impact your growth and success. Kendall is inspiring, entertaining, and a bit surprising, which reminds me, don't open those boxes just yet. Please help me welcome my friend and fellow Pitt State alumnus, Kendall Gannon. Can everybody hear me okay? Maybe hear me too well? Uh, first and foremost, I honor you for being here today because you, you had to make that choice, number one. And somebody also had to make that choice to, to elect you to come, so this is awesome. Um, I heard about Boy State when I was in high school from my best friend uh, who had gone to it. I'd never heard of it before then. And then he, when he told me about everything uh, that they did, I, I was, I, I mean, I was jealous. I, I was the athlete in the school, but I was jealous of what he got to do. So again, I honor you all. Let's see if we can get this set up and we will be good to go. All right. As Brad mentioned, I've been very fortunate to enjoy some unique successes throughout my life. I played in Super Bowl 30, I uh, helped win a national championship at Pittsburgh State University, and I was the first long snapper ever added to a Pro Bowl roster in the NFL in 2005. Um, but thank you, man, I appreciate it. <laughs> you are in fact the first crowd to clap at that last one, so I appreciate that. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Uh, but those life events, along with some others that I want to share with you today, did not happen through mere chance or circumstance. We all have the ability to do great things, to lead a rewarding life. Now, no doubt what I did may have been a little bit more public than some, but what I did to get there, it's not exclusive to me. We all have this ability. Now, some of you might be saying, but Kim, I could never play in the NFL, and certainly I would grant you that is true. Physical strengths and abilities are different for each and everybody, each and every one of us. But we can all work to build our emotional strength and our emotional abilities. Emotions are what drive us as human beings. When we're attentive to how they affect us both individually and collectively, our ability to succeed increases dramatically. That success, I believe, is directly proportional to the emotional strength you build, first in yourself and then others. Because if you focus purely on the physical, eventually you plateau and you never reach your full potential. Now, I'm not suggesting that we 
dismiss physical strengths. It's what got me to the NFL. I was a long snapper. Who knows what a long snapper is? Okay, who, who doesn't know what a long snapper is? Okay, and there's some other people who don't care what a long snapper is. And that's okay, but I'm watching you because you didn't raise your hand either time. So just know, I'm watching. For 15 years in the NFL, I threw a piece of aired up leather between my legs as fast and as accurately as possible. Only in America. It's truly a beautiful country. <laughs> On uh, punts, I would snap the ball 15 yards to the punter and he would kick it naturally. 0.8 seconds or less was the snack, snap. And then on field goals, uh, eight yards to the holder to set it down. And with that one, 0.37 seconds, the ball was traveling about 40 miles per hour. And as you can see, as I said, eight yards. The ball was snapped at a five degree angle. So we're gonna have a little fun here, which is, Every time that I snapped the ball to the holder for field goals, the ball rotated a certain number of times. If you've read my book or if you've heard me speak before, you're excluded from this, uh, this uh, uh, question and game. But otherwise, just uh, take a guess of how many times you think the ball rotated in those eight yards. 40, 400, 300, 400. Who's, okay, uh, first of all, I like that everybody uh, everybody was talking. I, I spoke to a group a couple weeks ago and, and it was silence so they didn't want to talk to me at all. But who said three? Said Come up here, sir. Did you say three? Who said three? Somebody said three. Oh, well, come up here. Come on now. This is like the price is right. In the interest of social distancing, I'll let you right there. Yep, but in the interest, I'll, I'll be there. We, we'll, we'll do this, just in case, even though I am vaccinated. Okay, so you said three, right? Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> but you were the closest. What's your name? Dominic. Dominic. Nice to meet you, Dominic. Abby Kimball. The ball that I snapped each and every time for 15 years rotated exactly three and a half revolutions. Anybody happen to, th to think why that was? That was the laces, exactly right. So, each and every time that I snapped the ball, three and a half revolutions, the ball hit right here. I would, they would catch it and they would set it down. Because otherwise, if it was back behind here, they didn't want to, they didn't want to kick the laces or they didn't want to spin the ball up either. You guys, it's passed you by. Some of you may have seen uh, in the past uh, Ace Ventura. They talk about laces out, Dan. I didn't want the little kicker chasing me uh, down because he missed the winning kick because uh, he, he had to kick the laces. So, um, Dominic, how do you, you're gonna, this is a tough one for me. I give prizes. How do you spell that, Dominic? Okay, Dominic, I appreciate you uh, playing along. Next time, next time I ask a question, everybody's gonna yell, yell everything out. I, I understand that, but I signed this ball to you, says to Dominic, laces out, Kendall Gammon. So I signed it for a couple reasons. I wanted to personalize it, number one. And number two, now that I signed it, it has zero value. <laughs> so I don't even have to worry about it being uh, sold on, on eBay. So we're good to go. Have a great time. Give him a hand. All right, like I said, we're talking with each other today. We're not, I'm not talking to you. I don't want to be a talking head. We're going to have fun. We're going to try to create anchors. I don't want to just entertain you today for roughly four hours. No, I'm kidding. Just for an hour. I want to create anchors so you can take this out into the real world, just like this week, so you can take it out of the real world, employ this, uh, hopefully, for the rest of your life in some fashion, in some sense. All right. I want to take you into my world uh, with the Kansas City Chiefs my last seven years. I played 15 years my last seven with the Chiefs. Uh, when I would come out uh, every game, home or away, about an hour and 15 minutes before the game start, started, I would practice punts, I'd practice field goals, uh, and we'd go about it. After that, I'd walk to the sideline, and really at that point in time, I, I, really, I didn't have anything to do anymore because I wasn't a position player anymore. Believe it or not, I used to weigh 310 pounds. 
So back then, number one, it looked like I ate a, a small human being. And number two, if it wasn't bolted down, I was eating it. Uh, but anyhow, I would come out the sideline. Now, I could have taken that time to just kind of soak it in, uh, but I chose to do something different, which is I would take a ball, like the one that I gave to Dominic, and I'd walk around the stadium, and I'd find a kid in the crowd with her family, and I'd walk up to them, and I would give them a ball. And just tell them to enjoy their day with their parents and their family, trying to make a memory. I was doing it for no other reason than I thought it was the right thing to do, that I wanted to make a difference with somebody. I think in life, if you ever follow me on social media, and you may never have beforehand, hopefully you will a little bit afterwards, but is that, that is my one mantra. In everything you do, make a difference. Make a difference. If you make a difference, this world becomes a little bit better place. So now, I told you I did that every game, home and away. Tell you a story, I did it in Oakland, in that, that, that junky place. They, 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 they're, they're in the nice confines of Las Vegas now, but we used to play in, in Oakland, and that was a nasty place, although it was my favorite place to play because it was a nasty place. I don't understand that, but I, I love the atmosphere. But I remember one time, I'm walking, I see a kid in the black, near the black hole. If you remember what the black hole was, the guys, are, they got face paint, they got, they got spikes coming out, they got Darth Vader mask on. I mean, it's really a pretty cool thing. And I remember, I remember walking up to this little, ki this little kid and his parents and walking toward him, but also Raider, or Raider fan was right next to him. And Raider fan was, I mean, he was inventing cuss words at me. He, did, he didn't know why I was walking towards him, and he certainly didn't know there was a 10-year-old boy next to him. But he did not like the fact that Kendall Gannon, or actually number 83, was approaching the bench. And the closer I got, the louder I got, and the more, more vulgar the things got. Kind of funny, but all the same. But I walked up to that kid who had a Raiders jersey on, a number 18, which at the time was Randy Moss, so that was a double negative to me at the time, although I know Randy and he's a great dude. But I walked up to the kid and I said, have you ever gotten a game ball before? And he said no, or actually he said, <laughs> and I took that to mean no. And I said, well, you know what? I hope you have a great time with your family today and enjoy this ball. Right then, Raider fan stopped dead in his tracks. And he just kind of put his head down like this. And it's funny, I'll never forget this. And he, he just kind of shook his head. He goes, 83, can, can you just leave? He goes, I can't boo you now. Just get out of here, please. <laughs> Again, make a difference. <clears throat> did I make a difference with that kid? Absolutely, I did. Did I make a difference with a Raider fan? Yeah, I did. Always understanding that what you do can directly affect people, and it can indirectly affect people in everything we do no matter what it is, in the smallest things, for sure. Now, I want to take, if you can imagine seven years with the Chiefs playing 20 games a year because of the preseason at the time, and a few more for playoffs, that's a lot of balls I gave away. So you can imagine, I got a lot of letters, a lot of pictures sent to me, they wanted me to sign it, they, they talked about different things. Um, sleep with the ball a day, a week, a month, one was a year, I'm not sure I was real popular with those parents. Um, and I remember, uh, well actually, I, I remember I got one from another parent that said they got the ball and immediately uh, their son wanted to leave the game because he was afraid that it would get stolen. So I assume that was in Oakland, but I don't, I don't remember for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but all the same, you can imagine, and I want to show you this one. This is one I got from Dustin Beath, Pawnee City, Nebraska. He was 10 years old, you can, I don't know if you can read it at all, but he was very happy. I gave him a ball against the Detroit Lions, and he just said, good luck Sunday against the Colts. Uh, that didn't go so well, by the way, but all the same, um, a pretty cool letter. Now, I bring that up because I think it's kind of cool that things like that, it was, it, that wasn't my intent to be thanked for it. I was just wanting to make a difference. I mean, those seven years, uh, newspaper, radio, TV, they never followed me around. Nobody knew I was doing this. This was simply because I thought it was the right thing to do, and I wanted to affect somebody in a positive manner. I wanted to do something for them that they would never forget, hopefully. So, that was a, quite a long time ago. About five years ago, I woke up, I had a direct message on Twitter, and I'm not a big direct message on Twitter uh, guy, so this was, this was a little bit different for me, and it was Dustin Beef. And he says, hey, do you remember me? You gave me a ball when I was 10. 
<laughs> and I just, you know, I text him back and kind of chuckle. I was like, yeah, Dustin, I actually do remember you. You sent me a letter and, and I use it when I speak. And I asked him how he was doing and he told me, I said, man, you, I mean, you must be about out of college by now. He said, yeah, I'm 23 years old. Uh, I went to a technical school. I'm going to be a welder. And we talked a little bit more. And at the end, before we left, I just said, hey, one more question. Do you still have that ball? And what he said to me will always move me and, 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 and make me break up a little bit, which he said, I will never not have that ball. Any time in life, guys, that you can do something that makes somebody never not have a memory, never not remember, never not know how good a thing was done, when you can affect somebody for a lifetime, doesn't matter what it is, that's a good thing. You all are leaders in here, and this week, you're gonna to continue to, be, to rise up and become better leaders. And leaders affect people positively. They do things that others sometimes can't, or just won't. You're a special group. And in seven days, when you graduate this, you're gonna be even more special. If you try to make a difference, and you understand that the power you have, and understand that the little things that you have, the power, is a wonderful thing. So, let's take a time out. Well, it's a long time out, by the way. <laughs> what happened here? All right. Let's take a time out. You know, I talked about being a long snapper. Roles. Is long snapping important? Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, is it flashy? No, it's not really. I mean, my, my, my job description was snap ball, get crap knocked out of you. And I just figured it hurt less if it was a good snap. But in, in life in general, we all have roles. Some bigger, some, some lesser. You know, many people, uh, a lot of people would like to have lived my life and been in the league for 15 years in the NFL, played in the Super Bowl, I, you know, broadcast a Super Bowl. For me, I mean, honestly, with the exception of the putter and the kicker, I was the worst athlete on the field. Um, I mean, I was a, a decent offensive lineman at times, but I was never a starter. If I couldn't long snap, I never would have played in the league. But I provided a talent and a skill that was unique and that was needed, and it made a difference. Think about that in your life and what you do. Whether you're on some activity, and whether you're in some sport, some church activity, whatever it may be, what is your role? Because you have one, sometimes it takes a while to figure it out. But understand, everybody has a role. Starting with yourself, and then recognizing others as well. I think that's so very important as a leader. I'm sure you will talk about that some this week. Week, Is it important? Does it impact others? When I snapped the ball three and a half revol revolutions, was that important? Yeah. It absolutely was. Now, when I left college to go to the NFL, I was drafted in uh, the 11th round, uh, 291st person taken, so right away feeling really good about myself. Um, and I've already dated myself because I know there's only seven rounds now, but there used to be 12. In fact, by the way, just as an aside, the 11th and 12th rounds uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, they would let the radio announcer uh, take the picks because those guys generally didn't make the team anyhow. So I wasn't even drafted by the team. I was drafted by the radio announcer. It's the equivalent of Mitch Holtis, the voice of the Chiefs. That's who I was drafted by was Myron Cope of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But again, what I did, did it impact it, uh, it, uh, others? It did, absolutely. Now, when I came into the league, I, had, I wasn't snapping the ball with the laces. I'd never even heard of that. In fact, actually, we had a little South African kicker by the name of Gary Anderson. He played 18 years. He was in the Pro Bowl, All-Pro. He should be in the Hall of Fame, but, and maybe he will someday, but he's not yet. But the guy was about this tall. We kind of lead him out on the field. He was a cute little guy. Um, uh, just a solid person. But I remember he came up to me in this this little South African accent and just said, hey, Kendall, uh, could you snap the ball so the laces are pointing out? And I just looked at him like, this guy's on drugs. What is he talking about? <clears throat> but I was like, 
Sure. I'm, I, for all I knew, that's what every every snapper in the NFL did. So I was like, I better get this going. So I worked on it for a few days and kept working on it during camp. And lo and behold, I figured out that I could do it. And I could do it consistently. And I did it my whole career. Little did I know that I was basically the first person in the NFL to start doing that on a consistent basis. I didn't know any better. Think about your life. Are people going to ask you to do things that you've never heard of, that you maybe seem weird? They will at some point in time. And you may not know the gravity of the situation and the difference that it makes with somebody. Again, make a difference. You may not know that difference. But as you get proficient at what's going on, you're going to start to understand and be like, oh, wait a minute, okay, I understand this now. I, I need to get on this. I know for me, once he explained it to me, I was like, well, that makes sense. I mean, I wouldn't want to kick the laces either. Or I wouldn't want to see the ball spinning either. By snapping the ball with the laces out each and every time, that gave the kicker the best chance to make a field goal or an extra point. If we scored every time we had a chance with a field goal or an extra point, that gave the team a better chance to win. And that was what I was about. Now, throughout my career, every kicker that I snapped for either had their best year or their second best year percentage-wise. So I know what I did made a difference. And that's very important. Now, did they write about it in the papers? They did not. And they never will for the most part. But that's okay, because I knew about it. The kicker knew about it, and actually the team knew as well. And, and as I said, it doesn't make a difference. I got ahead of myself. So, let's keep going here. Just so you can see, I mean, that doesn't really look like me, does it? I put that up there because... I like the picture, and I'd like to prove to people that actually I used to be big at one point in time. Now I'm, I'm much smaller. Uh, but that was me, my, I think, second year in the league. As I said, 310 pounds at that point in time. If it wasn't bolted down, I was eating it. But you know what? You're never a finished product. And oftentimes, um, to get to where you want to go, there's some, some awkwardness along the way. I would expect this week, you're going to be asked to do some things that may be awkward at times. You're going to be pushed outside your comfort zone probably at times, I would guess. I mean, I'm jealous of you all because I would love to sit through and go this for a week. I certainly when I was 18 or 17, whatever age you may be, that would have been great. That's what I was. But... It's not pretty, is it? I understand. That's something you can't unsee. That's actually me coming out of college. I was an All-American my senior year. We won the national championship. I thought I was put together pretty well. That is not put together pretty well, I, I assure you. I weighed 273 pounds. I went to Pittsburgh State. They didn't even know enough to understand that there's no H on the end of Pittsburgh. But again, think about it. You all, in, in your teens, you're developing. You're not where you're going to be. That's why you're here, so you can develop and get better and learn and understand and grow. And not just physically, but more importantly, emotionally. I talk about emotional strength. We're going to talk about emotional strength, emotional communication, because it's about communication. This world is about communication. If Gary Anderson, the little kicker, didn't communicate with me, uh, to me that he, he wanted the ball a certain way, I never would have tried it. So it wouldn't have been my fault if nobody told me that. I just thought that's what you did. Understanding you're never a finished product. So, again, another time out. We all have challenges. You know, for me, my challenge, I didn't know it at the time. I went to the combine and I was also the first long snapper ever invited to the combine. They thought I could maybe play an offensive line position as well, so that helped. Uh, but my challenge, honestly, was my body. I didn't know it at the time. And I kept working at it. I was 22 at the time, and then uh, you know, the next three or four years is when I got bigger. Again, those challenges, how are you going to rise to them? What are you going to have to overcome? As a, for me, again, it was a body. I was, for lack of a better word, I was soft. It happens. But I believed. I went to Pittsburgh State with a goal to play in the NFL. Now, that was a little bit of a, a, a big, hairy, audacious goal. I kept it to myself. Others didn't have to know. I mean, I wanted to help the team. I wanted to win league, win national championship, and do all those things, and we accomplished those. I only practiced that for one league, or one loss, my entire career. 
uh, at Pittsburgh State University. Belief. Do you believe in yourself? That is the most important thing you can do in life, I believe, is believe in yourself first. And then as a leader, can you, do you believe in others to help them believe in their self? You all here are your leaders. But there's going to be people be, be around here who are helping you out throughout the week. They're going, to, they're going to help you believe that you can be more than you are. And you probably believe you can be more than you are right now or else you wouldn't be here. And I commend you for that. But always having somebody to help lead you and get the most out of you and push you out of your comfort zone. So very important. And I love this quote. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you are right. I think it's Henry Ford that said that. I'm going to say it again. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you are right. And I'm guessing many of you have heard that before, but I think it's worth revisiting. So, let's move on. Possibly. So we're going to have a little fun. You figure if I'm a long snapper, then I've got other weird skills also. I'm actually juggling. I've juggled center ring for Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Belly Circus, not once but twice. It was during my career. I remember when the PR staff came down and said that the circus was looking for somebody to come and do a, a, a PR opportunity to uh, kind of pop a circus that was going to be in town that weekend. They went nuts. They were so happy to come find me because they knew I juggled, but there'd never been a, a, a reason for it at one point in time. And by the way, for all you smart asses here, I'm the, I'm the one on the right. I'm trying to figure out which one's the clown. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Juggling mesmerizes a lot of people. And oftentimes I'll hear some people say, well, that's really cool, but I could never juggle. And the fact is, we all have the ability to juggle. Now, to what degree? That's certainly up for conjecture. But if we're healthy, we have the ability to juggle. In fact, I'm gonna teach you all to juggle here a little bit later. And if you already know, then we're gonna teach you to juggle more. But the fact is, the problem that some people have who think they can't juggle, or have tried to juggle and can't, is they only focus on one object. Now, as I'm juggling, these are, this is three. How, how many clubs are in the air at one time and how many clubs are in the hands? One. One. One's in the air at all times, right? And the other two are in the hands. So I'm aware of all three clubs. I'm focusing on one that's in the air and the other two I can feel in my hands. Now clearly I do this pretty well because you see I'm, I'm looking at you all. I'm looking through this. But the problem is when you only look at one object, then you just, the other two drop. And this is not juggling. This is just simply playing catch with the club. And I bring that up because we have three parts of our life. This is what this is gonna to get to with the, me the metaphor. We have our personal life, we have our friends and family life, and we have our professional life. So let's look at that a little bit different way. Those are clubs, now we're gonna juggle rings. Although we're not going to juggle them and look right into the lights, or else we're going to drop them. I talked about the three parts of our life. That's what I want you to think about with the rings. Your personal life, your friends and family, and your profession. Those are the three things that everything else springs off of. Think about those as each ring. Now, as I'm juggling, well, let's, let's have a little fun here. dropped one. <laughs> Guys, it, it gets kind of windy in here every once in a while, so just <laughs> so you know. Uh, try it one more time. <clears throat> oh, 
Oh, now you hear, I heard it over here. Oh, exactly right. That is the proper response. Yes, we got the colors going. Yeah, absolutely. It was a sympathy clap, but I will take it. <laughs> And by the way, that is the correct response when I juggle, is to clap as much as possible. I saw a couple people not clapping though, so I'm, I'm watching you all. All right. Now, when I first started juggling, well, as I said, the clubs representing the three parts of our life, our personal, our friends, our family, and our, and our uh, professional. Profession for you right now is your your school or your, or your sport or your activity, whatever you may be in, something. Of course, we know what friends and family is, and the personal is a very important one also that we're going to talk about. Because who do you talk to the most every day? Yourself, Yourself absolutely. We have about 250,000 thoughts go through our head a day. That's a lot of thoughts, and we will touch on that a little bit later. But again, as I started juggling, if I'm looking straight on, I see that line, like you can see back behind me, and you all can see this line. Now, as I continue to juggle, I turn the side, you're like, okay, they got some shape, you saw the white. And then as I got crazy and I started manipulating things like you'd never seen before, you saw the crazy colors. You're like, okay, there's more to this. And what I'm talking about is that those three parts of your life, there, there, there's more than one angle to look at. There's, there's more to it than just one thing here. Now. There's another thing that's very important also, which is, as I look at this, you and I right here, we, we see this straight line. But over here, guys, what color is this ring? Blue. Blue. What color is this ring over here? Now, wait a minute here. No. No, you, you can't both be right. And I don't see either color. I just see the line. And when I moved here, I still see the line. And what I'm trying to bring up is talking about perspective and how you see things. You know, for me, no matter how I move and how I juggle, I'm always going to see that straight line. But as I move, others are going to see the white. I mean, because, you know, if all of a sudden, when you, you thought it was just white, and then I start manipulating it, and you're like, okay, I say blue. They, were, they can see it from a different angle. You start to take yourself out of your shoes and put them in, into somebody else's, gaining a new perspective. If ever in this world there were a time to have perspective and try to see things from another per, a point of view, it would be now with everything that's going on politically, uh, with, I mean, you, you name it, and trust me, I'm not gonna talk about political stuff today. I'm, you, you're not gonna trap me on that one. But the fact is, understanding and, and, and realizing that there, might, that there might just be more than one right answer. Now, in math and things like that, there may just be one answer, and I, I get that. But in some things, there may be more than one right answer. There might be more than one wrong answer. Gaining that perspective, empathizing with somebody a little bit and understanding something from their point of view as a leader, that is huge. If you think you're right all the time, I just, just trust me, you're not. You may be right a lot of the time, you may be very, very bright, but the fact is it doesn't happen. And the most important thing is understanding and learning from the times you're wrong. Because you never fail, you just simply try again. The only time you fail is if you quit. But again, having that perspective. So, I think we're gonna take, oh, that's what I wanna talk about. Excuse me. When I learned to snap, or when I learned to juggle, It took a long time to learn both of those. It took a lot of persistence, physical persistence, doing it over and over and over again. But I'm not gonna to talk to you about just persistence. I wanna to talk to you about emotional persistence. And emotional persistence is looking through someone or something from multiple angles that allows you better understanding. Again, looking at something, someone or something from multiple angles that allows you better understanding. 
And it's through this knowledge that you give both yourself and those you lead the best chance for success. Now there's one word in there that is so very important. So important. Understanding. Because understanding, it does two things, guys. It takes away fear and it fosters relationships. If you can help someone understand, you will take away fear and you will foster relationships. And when you do those two things in life, you've always got a chance. It doesn't mean it's going to happen right away and it doesn't mean it's automatic, but you've got a chance. That's a, I think that's one of the biggest things that we miss in this world is we understand it, so why don't you understand it? Actually, I've taken my, my disc profile and all kinds of personality, personality profiles. I get terse. I have issues if people don't get things right away, if I get them. And I had to understand that. And I have a feeling that I was probably a pretty big jerk at times in certain situations because it was, it was plain and obvious to me. So if it's plain and obvious to me, why isn't it plain and obvious to them? They're stupid. No, they're not. They just see it a different way. Then maybe they learn a different way. Again, creating that understanding. Perspective, as I said. Acknowledging all three parts of your life, your personal life, your professional life, and your friends and family. Looking at points of view, stepping out of your shoes and into the shoes of somebody else so you can see it from their angle and their view. And finally, recognize your unique skills. I think we would all agree that throwing a piece of aired up leather between your legs is unique. Now, I didn't recognize that skill though. I was screwing around in college. I didn't snap until my third year in college. I was there five years, I redshirted. My third year, I'm screwing around. I, I was. I was just kind of curious about how the ball rolled out of the hands. And so I was doing it before practice. And a coach saw me and realized I could do it better than anybody else on the team. And so they wanted me to be a long snapper. Now, if you're in football and, and or you know anything about offensive linemen, uh, we're allergic to running. And I wanted no part of running down and chasing a kick 40 yards down the field and trying to tackle somebody. Number one, it wasn't going to happen because I wasn't athletic. And number two, I just didn't like to run. I was in college, 280 pounds, 310. But you know what? I also made my living for 15 years doing that very skill. If a coach doesn't identify something, that unique skill in me, and more importantly, I'm not coachable and I don't take it in, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you like I do. I do this all over the country. Be coachable. This week, you're going to have people suggest things. You're going to have a material. I don't know what all it is, but I know it's going to be valuable. And some of it, at first glance, may not strike you as important. But look at it a different way and understand that it's important. Understand the uniqueness of some of the things going on and the skills you have. You're here because you're unique. Definitely understand that. I talk about the, the personal side of it. Personally understand that you are a special person and that you're here because of what you've done and how you've been identified. That is a good thing. And never forget that. And I'll tell you, at, at your age, I went to Rose Hill High School. I was all league, all state, everything. And everything was perfect, except I, I had body image issues. I, I couldn't talk to girls. I mean, you name it, I had all kinds of issues. I was able to hide behind my sports. But again, when people help you, be present, be aware, and be accepting of that help. help. Be accepting of that coaching. All right, I'll have to go back. Now, I talked about what I did in the NFL for 15 years, which is snap ball, get crap knocked out of you. And I may explain it a little bit, but I think sometimes it's better if you can see it visually. So I made a, if you can call it a highlight reel of me uh, in the NFL. I circled myself a little bit because you just don't naturally pick out the long snapper. So uh, we'll try to have a little fun with this.
helping the tight end just went down like he was shot. Well, Buchanan, <laughs> Buchanan, Buchanan sat guys down. But Buchanan makes a move on Kendall Gannon, number 83. And when he makes his move, Gannon, watch over on the left hand side. See the guy at the top? Watch him. He's going to make a move and he just goes down. <laughs> That is Kendall Gannon, the long snapper for Kansas City, and he was hurt on this play. You'll see it on the uh, replay right after the snap. They just actually run over him here. He gets knocked down. Now watch when he gets up again. His own man hits him, and he goes back. And then Gammon, we saw him go down twice. He fell down a third time as he was trying to hustle downfield to cover that kick. So it was Guys, if you can't laugh at yourself, then there's something wrong. You know, Self-deprecating humor and, and understanding that we're never perfect, I think, is very important. Now, um, what's interesting about that also, uh, if there's anything interesting, you know, when he said I went down like I was shot, I did feel like I was shot. But actually what had happened was when I came off the line of scrimmage, believe it or not, um, one of my uh, right guard, I think it was my right guard's knee, hit me, no, it would have been left, knee hit me right there directly perfectly and I broke my leg now I didn't know I broke my leg uh, I just knew that something really really hurt I mean hurt a lot and uh, I got up and I'm running and I'm, I'm just I, I, I'm running and everything's you, you know calculating you know calculating in my mind I'm like what, what's going on here I, I do I feel like I've been shot I didn't know what was going on I'm like and I'm thinking quickly I'm like I hope I don't have to try to make a tackle because that's not going to work and as you saw it did not but believe it or not, okay, as Phil Buchanan was coming down to my right, I saw it, and all of a sudden I saw the hole open up where he was running. I was like, crap. Of all times for us to not have great coverage, this is the time. So I, I knew, I took an angle, because, you know, as an offensive lineman, and as, a, and as a, you know, again, after the punter, I'm the worst athlete on the field. So I take angles. I, 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 I consider myself a sheepdog. I heard them. I, I heard the... the, the uh, the ball carry to somebody else and let them make the tackle. I think tackles are showy. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, you just get that one. Yeah, didn't make a lot of tackles in my NFL career. <clears throat> but I'm taking that angle and I see he's coming and I'm like, crap, it's open. I've got to do something. I've got to redirect him a little bit. And believe it or not, even though you see me just go down, I did take an angle that made Philip Buchanan hesitate just a second and then go back in just a little bit. And then I allowed the backside to come and make the tackle. So I made a difference there with that, although it, it didn't really look like it. Now, I kept snapping the entire first half. I mean, it just hurt. I didn't know what was wrong. And I also knew this. We didn't have another long snapper uh, on the team that, that really did that. We had a backup. Um, but my team was counting on me. And it, I wasn't going to not go in there. Now. Every time I snapped the ball and tried to run or, or, or do anything, I would fall down. I can even, you know, I can remember Will Shields, Brian Waters, you know, Willie Rofer, like, Kendall, dude, it, it hurts me seeing you fall down. Just, just, just snap the ball, just snap the ball and stop. You know, but I would keep trying and everything. At halftime, they did x-ray my leg. They realized it was broke. And I said, well, I'm going to play anyhow. And they're like, if you're going to go in, we'll, we'll take your helmet. I was like, okay. I, I won't. And so I, I didn't. And I, I said that because I knew if it came down to one last uh, field goal to win the game, I knew I could get in for one play before they'd take my helmet. So I tried to play sparingly. But luckily, we ended up winning the game pretty handily. Jared Allen, uh, who used to play for the Chiefs and will be in the Hall of Fame someday as a uh, defensive end, it was our backup snapper. And he, did, he did a pretty good job getting through us. But, you know, for me, it was never a question, even when I was running down the field or once I was off the field um, and the doctors were looking at me and I knew something hurt. The, the, pain, the pain was some of the worst pain I've ever had before. But I was part of the team and I wasn't going to let them down in my mind. And I don't, I mean, I don't think anybody thinks that I let them down when they took me out of the game because my, my, my knee was, or, or rather my, my leg was broke. But it's an important thing in terms of being part of the team and, and being a leader 
however you can. I was able to lead even as somewhat the worst athlete on, on the team. And I keep bringing that up for one reason. It's true. I mean, I, but I didn't let that define me. You know, I worked out hard in the off season. I worked as hard as I could to try to push others so they couldn't dog it because they didn't want to get beat by me. And, and if I'm pushing it hard and they're getting beat by me, and then that's going to push them harder also. So I felt like I was helping the team. Now, a lot of guys had respect for what I did during the season, the long staff, and they had a lot of respect uh, for, how, for, for how I handled myself. We have something in the NFL called the National Football League Players Association. We have a union that fights for our rights of everything as a player, and we meet every year, and we vote as a team for two people on the team uh, to represent them. Ten of my 15 years, I was one of those representatives. So, did the, did the team respect me? They absolutely did. Or they didn't have a clue what they were doing when they were voting. One of the two, I'm going to go with the respect thing. Because they knew I cared. They knew I wanted to make a difference. They respected how I held myself. Trust me, they, they probably understood what kind of athlete I was also. And, and by the way, I mean, I played a regular position in, in, in college and was an All-American in Division II. So, I was pretty good. You just have to understand that in the NFL, these are world-class athletes, so being number 52 or 53 is not a bad thing in my mind. So that's why I kind of joke about it a little bit. Yeah, we've got the, here we go. So let's talk about commitment. I was getting back and up, back up, every time I got knocked down, no matter what, even though I'd had a, a bad thing happen to me. Be where your feet are. We're gonna talk about that one in, in a minute. I'm a little bit. Uh, confused on my, my order, but this one, can others count on you? As a leader, can people count on you to do your job the way you need to do it? And as a leader, not only being that example, but they can get others to be that way also, so important. And finally, will you get back up? Whether you have a broken leg, no matter what it is, will you get back up? That was through no fault of my own, it just happened, but I kept going. But I want to tell you a quick story about be where your feet are. I remember one game in Arrowhead, specifically, uh, <clears throat> running out to the middle of the field for a punt. And we're jogging out there and getting ready to go, and I'm, you know, I'm just doing my job. And all of a sudden, or getting ready to do my job, all of a sudden somebody comes back behind me and clips my heels accidentally, just jogging, and trips me. And I fall flat on my face, right on the Arrowhead, in the middle of Arrowhead Stadium. And I hear a collective gasp from 77,000. And I'm not kidding, I literally heard it. And do you think I was embarrassed? Yes, I was embarrassed, are you kidding me? I got up, I was inventing cuss words now, I was looking for who did it. Uh, of course, nobody did it, but the game was about to, to go. We had fourth down, we had to snap it, so all of a sudden, I had to get back into my mode. I couldn't let that do anything. Got over, snapped the ball, I just went about my business. So why do I tell that story? And it's this, about be where your feet are. Had I been preoccupied with who tripped me, with how embarrassed I was of hearing the 77,000 just kind of look at me like, dude, dude just fell on, the, on, on his face. He doesn't have a clue what's going on. Had those things been in my mind when I snapped the ball, there would have been the opportunity for error to, to do things not to the degree that I needed to do them in a game. Because you've got to clear the mechanism when you're in an NFL game, when you're, you're doing something. You've got to be tuned in. And I had to be tuned in for what I'm doing. And I was, and I did my job and I went about my business. As I always say, one snap and clear. Whatever just happened, don't let it affect something else. Good or bad, don't let it affect the, the next thing. You do what you do. Had I been preoccupied with, with that embarrassment and, and now made a bad snap because I just wasn't honed in, something that really didn't matter would have affected something that really did matter. And I think as leaders, we're called to understand that and be able to have perspective and see it and communicate it to others and be able to get our mind right and be ready to go. What does that look like? Okay, that means I did it right. Good. All right, so we juggled, we juggled clubs, we juggled rings, and I was like, well, okay, it's the circus. I should juggle balls also. 
But juggling reg regular balls now would be a little bit like anticlimactic. Would, would you agree? Yeah, so what am I going to do? Hopefully. We'll see. I saw it on YouTube yesterday. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Bully balls. Oh, thank you. A little bit of light. We'll see. We tried this earlier. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to throw this first ball up, and I'm going to throw this second ball up, <clears throat> then I'll throw the third ball up, and then I'm going to run like hell. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to try to get those and do it now. Believe me, and some of the guys that are here uh, saw me practicing earlier because of lights. Every once in a while, I, I will drop them. The balls will hit each other. And if they do, they will that they can spring out to the crowd, you never know. If you've ever seen two balls, uh, bowling balls hit, it, it's pretty interesting. So if that happens, just play along with it, make a look of terror. Uh, you guys in the front row, don't worry about it, it'll come, it'll come naturally. So, <laughs> so we'll see if we can do this. In complete candor, I was very nervous about that because <laughs> it's a little bit blinding up here. But I juggle bowling balls for another reason other than to completely enamor you and make you wild with wonderment, which is this. When we think about the three objects that we juggle, the three parts of our life, our personal life, our friends and family, and our professional life. When I was doing the rings, each one, it actually, it had different sides to it. It looked different. It wasn't the same. The three parts weren't the same. But, when I was doing the bowling ball, does this bowling ball change at all in how it looks from any side or if I change or anything? Is it, is, is it change or is it the same? same? It's the same, absolutely. And the other two, right? The same. And that's what I talk about, which is no one is a bowling ball. Nobody is a bowling ball. Bowling balls are perfectly round. It's a perfect color, everything. I think sometimes in life, we try to be perfect. And there's nothing wrong with trying to be perfect, but the fact is, nobody is. I am a perfect example. I started cracking about age 46 or 47, and it led to a lot of problems in my life. And I'm very open about that. I talk about it all the time. Because hopefully, if I talk about it, it will help others to not do what I did, which is try to be perfect, to try to look perfect, to try to impress, to, to try to make people be enthralled with what I am, to do whatever I could for everybody. Because I did that all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that, to a degree. Because... If you do all that, but you, take, you don't take care of yourself first, you're going to have an issue. Eventually, you're going to, you're going to crack. Whether the three parts of life, the professional, friends, and family, but what's that other one I always start with? Personal. Personal, absolutely. You've got to take care of you. You've got to take care of you. Self-care. More important ever. In this, hour, in, in this hour that I speak to you, Roughly 120 people, actually a little bit more by the CDC numbers now, uh, will take their life in the U.S. One every five minutes. That, that's egregious. You might, you might think, well, one, that's, that's not a lot. Well, no, it, it, unless you know the person. Then all of a sudden, and it's not Kevin Bacon's six degrees of separation. It's one degree of separation. I have no doubt in my mind that everybody in here has some personal experience with them. Either they thought about it, I may be preaching to the choir here because it's, it's a, a bunch of leaders, although you'd be surprised, but we, have, we, we know people or we've heard of situations and we're just like, no way. That's why I talk about it, self-care more than ever, especially with the pandemic and what's going, going on, the isolation. We're pack animals, we wanna be around people. 
We want to connect. And when, when we can't connect, when we're isolated, the only person we're talking to is ourself. And if we're, not, if we're not doing the right things, we're not saying the right things, all of a sudden it can get a little bit toxic. toxic. So, how many people in here have flown on an airplane? A lot of you, probably all, but maybe not all of you. At, at your age, I, ha I had actually not. But it changes. But again, mm. you, you see this in the plane, they, they talk about when you, in, the, in the sudden uh, case of loss of cabin pressure, this will drop, oxygen is flowing. Who do they tell you to put this on first? Yourself. Yourself, absolutely. Why? Because of hypoxia. Absolutely, you're gonna run out of oxygen. Very noble for you to all of a sudden help others put their mask on before you. But if you keep doing it, eventually you run out of oxygen. And now that good deed, it can't be perpetuated. The fact is though, if you put this on, you can, you can put masks on every, everybody else all day long. So again, understanding how you go about helping people, understanding how you look at yourself, understanding self-care. No one is a bowling ball, not trying to look perfect. Sorry guys. What is your emotional oxygen? What are you doing on a daily basis to take care of yourself personally? To be healthy mentally? I know for me, for many, many years, I wasn't doing much. I didn't read much. I wasn't into quotes. I, did, I, I wasn't, I, really what I was doing, I was like beating myself up. I had a lot of negative self-talk. And that's very common for NFL players. I practice, I didn't practice and play out of the joy of being part of it and the joy of winning. I practiced and everything really out of the fear of loss and the fear of not making the team. And that's very prevalent in the NFL. You ask players, a lot of them, that fear. And, and fear can be a healthy thing if it's used the right way in conjunction with other things. But you better have some emotional oxygen. And what can that be? It can be being around, <clears throat> being around positive people, getting those positive quotes, reading, reading positive books, coming to things like this, and being around like-minded people who are positive and who want to make a difference. Because I know you all do. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. I truly believe that. So I talk about one of my hashtags being make a difference. This is the other one, gratitude. Being grateful for what you have, for what you are, for who you are, for how others help you. Going on and on and on. You know, I talk about your emotional oxygen. For me, some of my own emotional oxygen is I have a gratitude journal. It's on my phone. It takes me roughly two minutes in the morning to do it every day. And I do it every single day because there's always something to be grateful for. Did your parents pay for you to, to come here? You should be grateful for that. If you're thinking, no, I, I worked, so I did that myself. No, somebody gave you that job and allowed you to make that money. So you didn't do it by yourself. You should be grateful for that. We have so much to be grateful for. And when we are grateful for those things, it helps change our life. I truly believe that. I've seen it in action with my life. I'm a big Brene Brown fan, and I love this one. I don't have to chase extraordinary moments to find happiness. It's right in front of me if I'm paying attention and I'm practicing gratitude. If you're grateful for your life and what's in it and what's going on, it helps tremendously. Now, the, the caveat is this. It doesn't mean everything's perfect. I didn't, say, I, I didn't say everything's perfect. I said be grateful for the things in your life that you should be grateful for. And more importantly, express it. Having gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping Christmas presents and never giving them. It doesn't do any good. You've got to unwrap it. You've got to understand what it is. So they've done studies at the University of Cal Davis. Uh, Dr. Robert Edmonds, he's written books. 
and just a few of these things I just want you to see about how important gratitude is. They've, they've done scientific studies with this and all of these improve dramatically percentage-wise if you keep a gratitude journal daily, weekly, and, and start to do it out over a couple months. And again, I've seen it myself. But the things that happen, better self-esteem. I mean, look at these. People like you more. Reduced turnover, you can't see that. You're happier. You exercise more, you sleep better. You become more effective managers, less stress. It goes on and on and on. Simply by identifying things you're grateful for on a daily basis. I identify three things that I'm grateful for every single day in the morning, like I said. And, and oftentimes, you know, they're, they're the same things. I'm grateful for, for my coffee. I'm grateful for a great night of sleep. I'm grateful that I have a bed. I'm grateful for my dog, Rebel. Things like that. It's not hard to find that. So, I've already got the focus. We're going to talk about focus in a minute. You all got a box when you came in here, correct? Okay, here in a minute. You can go ahead and get the box. And here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to open up that box. And when you open it up, you're going to see three packages. There's going to be three scarves. I want you to open up those uh, quickly and get those three scarves <coughs> in your hand and then stand up. Go ahead and put the box down and then stand up. We're going to have a little fun. I told you guys we're going to learn to juggle. It's elementary school again. Just make sure that the, the packaging gets in the trash. Okay. It's okay to hurry. You like that one? Will you go through, get those out of the package? Stand up, please. <laughs> Guys, you open Christmas presents quicker than this. You're going to get a scarf open. As you stand up, we'll start going with this. I'm going to be pressed for time. Juggling is simply throwing one thing from one hand to the other. That's all it is. I mean, this, just doing one is juggling. But this, this is the motion. All you're going to do is you're going to do this with three. Throwing it up and then catching it with the other hand. Then up and with the other hand. You can go ahead and do that with me with just the one. Why are we using scarves? They float, absolutely. You guys are great athletes probably, but not yet. So I see that. I love it. We got the one going. Okay, now, now we got... Now you're going to take two. And simply what you're going to do, you got one in each hand, you're going to throw one up, and when it's up there, you're going to throw the other, the other one underneath it. Up, and then the other, and then catch it. One, two, catch. One, two, catch. All right, you guys, you're amazing. You're geniuses. Okay, now we're going to do three. Who thought they were going to juggle today? I didn't think so. Who thought they were going to see bowling balls get juggled? I didn't think so. All right, so you're going to hold two in one hand. One's going to be kind of in the heel of your hand and the, the finger, the pinky there, and then your, your forefinger and your thumb is going to hold the other. You're going to throw that first. You're going to throw it across and then the other and just go back and forth. We're only going to do this for about 30 seconds. Go. Work with me. Come on now. Come on. Come on. That is great. This, so you got to keep juggling. Keep juggling. I gotta take a picture of that. Back and forth. Back and forth. Keep going. Now, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from that. I don't think it really happened in this group, 
But most of the time, when I speak to corporations, you know, some people are interested in it. They're, they're like, okay, that, this is cool. We're going to juggle. Some people are amb ambivalent. And then some other people are like, this, this is stupid. I don't want to juggle. I didn't come here to juggle. I, I came here to learn. But the fact is, you are learning while you're juggling. You're learning about your attitude and how you're going to embrace something. Because what you choose to focus on is how you're going to feel. Second to second, minute to minute, hour, to, hour by hour, day by day, year by year. What you focus on and the meaning you assign to something is how you're going to feel. Focus equals feelings. And your feelings ultimately determine what? Your quality of life. You decide that. Nobody else. That is the power of choice. That is the power you have. You decide the meaning you're going to assign to something. For the experience of juggling or the type of job you're going to do. If you're going to sweep the floor, you, you be the best darn floor sweeper ever. Whatever it may be. However you decide to approach something. Now, as leaders, I'm going to cut a little bit short because we're, 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 we're pressed for time. But I'm going to end on these, which is this. As a leader, understand that you're going to have those different perspectives from people. They're going to see things a different way. You've got to identify that and you've got to figure out how to deal with it. I, I've, 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 I've spoken to some companies where uh, they're all union and no matter what the company does, the, the company is bad. I mean, there, there's just this rift there. So I'm doing this stuff, and some people, when I, like I just did with you, the open the boxes and juggle, some people sat back there and they just stared at me like this. And they weren't going to participate. And that's fine, I just went, up, went on about my business. It's, it's not a problem. I, I, I dealt with it. I told, I'd been told that that might happen, but I gave away books that day also. They didn't want a book when I gave it away, but they snuck around and got one later on because they were interested. They were trying to decide how to do it. I, I didn't call them out or anything. I just chose to continue on with the group. Now that's one thing, one lesson. The other one is this. You know, I said to throw them back and forth like this. And then I also said, <clears throat> well, that, that was the main thing. So I said to go back and forth like this. But invariably, people have tried to juggle before or they, they just don't see it right in their mind, so they, they start doing this, or, or this, or, or some things. I don't even know what some of you were doing. That's okay. It's not a problem. As a leader, understand that just because you explain it and just because you understand it doesn't mean that they do. It doesn't mean that they do. And you may have to explain it more. Or you may have to get down there with it and help them. You may have to make them realize that, I mean, they may, some that were juggling the way I said, that wasn't the way I explained you thought you were doing it the right way. I get that. But sometimes it takes somebody else to identify that. It takes a leader to identify that. It takes a leader to figure out that a kid can snap. And all of a sudden he has a 15 year career in the NFL. And it takes a leader to understand that he was asked to snap the laces out because it's going to help the team. It takes leaders to identify things, to identify traits. And that's my message to you throughout this week. Be open, be honest, communicate. Communication is the essence of life. If you can't communicate, life doesn't exist, in, in, in my opinion. Embrace this week. Embrace it within yourself and embrace it with others. Find like-minded people. You are all going to get along perfectly. But there are people in here that you'll probably make friends with who may become lifelong friends or may become part of your inner circle. That is so important because that inner circle, that's going to help you also with the personal side of what's going on with you. You've got to be able to understand with the gratitude. Another thing that Brene Brown uh, talks about, and this would be another talk, but I'll just say this, which is vulnerability in the communication. Let people know you on something more than a surface level. And that's tough. And I, I'm, I'm going to explain this to you and give you this example. When I was your age, 
I was abused from age 10 to 16. Emotionally every day by my mom, and at times backed into the corner, hit in the head. We all agree that should not happen. That was tough. Nobody knew about it. I finally wrote about it in my book about 15 years ago. Years ago. But I didn't let it define me. It wasn't easy, and it had effects, but I didn't let it define you. Define me. Whatever happens to you, whatever you do, ultimately it's your decision. You define the tag you put on something and how you qualify it. That right there was vulnerability. Did anybody ever imagine that the guy who's in the, in the league 15 years, who's played in the Super Bowl, who has the Super Bowl, yada, 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 was abused as a kid, who had a, had a gun in his hand at age 16 because of that and thought about ending his life? That was me. That's vulnerability. I'm not saying you do that all the time and you don't do it to everybody, but I'm trying to give you a very deep, dark example and hopefully they'll be above there. I hope nobody has to deal with them. But I like to do that also to give people permission to understand that we all deal with things. We all deal with things. My time's up. I had a great time today. You guys have seven days coming up that are going to be fabulous. Embrace them. Embrace them. And go out and make a difference. You guys are leaving. You go out and make a difference. Raise your hands. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Social media is at Kendall Gammon or at Kendall Gammon 83 or KendallGammon.com is my email. If there's anything I talked about, some of those darker subjects that you want to talk about, you email me. If you email me, you will get a response within 24 hours and you'll have my phone number. I may not have all the answers, but I will help you get to the people who will help you get the answers or help your friends get the answers and maybe you're going to help them. So with that, again, thank you. Have a great week.